Do you want to get sponsored? Chances are you're thinking about this whole thing the wrong way. I signed athletes for Red Bull for the better part of a decade, so let me give you the perspective of what it's like to be on the other side of that discussion. Today we're going to talk about how sponsors think about sponsorship, the main mistakes that athletes make, and how you can make it so that the sponsors come to you instead of the other way around. Let's start off with the common misconceptions of why companies sponsor athletes. Number one, it's not because there's some mega corporation that has money to burn. Number two, they don't have to sponsor athletes at all. And number three, they're not sponsoring you because you're really, really good at your sport. These are the three things that people seem to get wrong all the time. So let me give you the five reasons why companies actually do support athletes. The first one is really straightforward. It's just about demonstrating their product. They have a functional product that works well for that sport and they want you to be the one using it to show that it actually works for that sport. This is pretty basic, pretty cut and dry, but it gets more complicated from here. The next thing is about demonstrating their values. So what are the brand values of this brand and how do you embody those different things? So you take a company like Red Bull and they're really about innovation. They're really about being on that cutting edge, that next new thing. And somebody that would demonstrate their values would be somebody that's on the come up, that is innovating a sport, that is doing something that's unexpected that fits a brand value for a company like Red Bull, and they wanna partner with athletes, for example, that fit that narrative. The number three reason is credibility. So if they have a product that fits in that space or they want to be aligned with that particular sport or space, they'll sponsor somebody there to give them credibility. This product is good because someone in this space is using it. So there's some level of credibility that you bring to the table. And number four ties into that. It's a little bit about brand visibility. So not only are they working with an athlete or many athletes in that space, but they wanna have visibility within that scene. So not only are they credible, but they're appearing in all kinds of different places across the sport or across the scene. Number five is a little bit prideful and it's really about clout. So you'll see this happen a lot where a company from outside of the space will come in and swoop the number one athlete in that sport. And it's more about aligning with the best athlete in the space. So they can say, oh, we work with the number one, we're involved with the number one, we only work with winners, blah, blah, blah. And that's really what it's all about. It's just clout. And this one, I don't know, I don't really necessarily think that's a long-term play by any means, but congratulations to the people that get that one. I think your sweet spot is obviously gonna be in the other four, where it's really gonna be about demonstrating the usefulness of the product, aligning with the values of the brand. And these are things that are gonna be longer-term things where you can build and grow together with the brand, which is ultimately where you wanna to get to with any sort of partnership. So what do sponsors want? After you've found this alignment from one of these five things we just talked about, what then happens? One of the main things sponsors want is something called activation. So what activation is, is essentially bringing that partnership to life. It's not enough anymore for you to just slap on their logo to your helmet and then just go off and do your thing. It really is about bringing this partnership to life bringing you closer to that brand and letting people know that, hey, this is a thing and we're working together and we're doing these things. And of course, a proper activation would tie back to the reason they worked from you, demonstrating the product, demonstrating their values, et cetera, et cetera. So activating the partnership could be anything from just some stuff online, giving them content for their channels, or even doing some in-person events or just getting engaged. A lot of activation when it comes to athletes and brands actually happens behind the scenes as well. For example, with Red Bull, we obviously had distributors who were putting cans on shelves at 7-Elevens and all this other stuff. And part of the activation would be going in and stoking out the guys that were doing all the work on the ground with the athletes or the events that we were putting on. We were activating that stuff sort of behind the scenes. So activation isn't always gonna be a public thing, but it's something that drives a ton of value for the sponsor. The next thing a sponsor is going to want to do is leverage your content. And you have to be careful here because you are over here making your content for your athlete content empire. And you don't want to just hand this off and let them build a community without you. That's an area where you have to be careful but you also can kind of ride both sides of it. You can give them some content, 
to help them grow their channel, but make sure that they're also driving stuff to your channels as well so that you can grow alongside them. If you can get this to work just right, you're in great shape. Having them include links to your stuff and point back to your channels to help you grow, if you can leverage that the right way, you're in a great spot. But what you don't wanna do is give them all their stuff and let them go off and run with it because then you're left kind of empty handed. When you get this right, it's great for both parties because not only are you their athlete, you're also an important part of their content creation cycle. And a lot of these smaller brands don't have their own production capabilities, so they rely on outside content creators to help them build their Instagram followings or their YouTube followings or their TikTok, et cetera, et cetera. So you can play a huge role in helping this brand grow, but you should also be mindful of what you're doing on your side and how you're leveraging what the sponsorship is doing and how that plays into your media empire. At the end of the day, the sponsor cares about the return on their investment or their ROI. So it's not enough for you to just put their sticker on your helmet and just run off and do your thing. You have to be valuable to them. And at the end of the day, they are a business and they're making this decision because they see some sort of value. Going back to those five brand values that we talked about earlier, how do you demonstrate those things for them? And how do you continue that partnership by continuing to pay into that? If they see this growing ROI and your audience is growing with your content, then it's a lot easier to have this discussion. Another misconception to add in here is that sponsored athlete equals sales. I don't necessarily think that's the case. Yes, there are absolutely opportunities where a sponsor could activate an athlete for sales, but I really think your focus should be more around demonstrating the product, demonstrating the brand values, thinking about credibility and thinking about brand visibility. I think all of those things combined together and the more of those you can check off, the more valuable you become as an athlete. Ultimately, the sales component is a great thing if it can happen. And sure, you could say like, oh, you did this one thing in sales with me and it equaled this, but that's such a difficult thing to connect when it comes to the marketing and sales sides of an organization. Those two departments don't really talk as much as you'd think, and you can't rely on sales really keeping you afloat. So think more about those other things that you might be doing where you can connect the dots on a lot easier things. I think that's where the sweet spot is gonna be when it comes down to partnering together. Okay, let me tell you the five pet peeves that I have with athlete proposals. and. Don't get me wrong, I've seen more of these than I care to remember, and some of the best athletes in the world still make these mistakes. So let me run you through these five and see which ones you've maybe you've already done. Number one is timing. So every business has a business planning cycle where they decide what are they going to do for the following year and then they allocate dollars against those things that they're going to do. Now there's usually an athlete sponsorship bucket if they already sponsor athletes and those decisions are traditionally made for most companies over the summer and then they're locked down early fall and then the deals actually start in January. That's a traditional fiscal calendar for most brands that are in the sporting space. So if it's the end of the year and you're reaching out to sponsors, you might be able to lock something down, but chances are you're not gonna get anything reasonable because they've already made the decision of how much money they were gonna spend and what they were going to do the following year. So if you're coming in at the end of the year trying to make something big happen, there's almost no chance of that going down. The second thing that drives me crazy is the I'll do anything approach to athlete partnership. So this whole thing is supposed to be a partnership. And if you come to me and say, I wanna be sponsored by you, I'll do whatever you need me to do, A, it means you haven't really thought too much about what this partnership might look like, and B, you're putting all of the work on me to figure out how we're going to use you. And I've got 50 other people coming to me wanting to work together, and if you're making me do work, I'm not going to have enough time or mental energy to really figure this out, and it makes it harder for me to connect the dots. Now, maybe you get lucky, and I've already been thinking about how we might work together, but I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on that. I think it's really challenging to go to somebody and be like, I wanna work with you, you tell me how it's gonna work. Like, I just don't think that makes any sense whatsoever. So 
you know, if you go into a partnership, have a very clear expectation and propose what you actually want to do together to activate that partnership. My third pet peeve plays into a little bit of what we just talked about, but really what it comes down to is not having any proposal whatsoever. And from an athlete side of view, this is kind of dangerous territory to be in because if you don't have a plan, you might get roped into their plan. And do you really want to go on a distributor nationwide tour, high-fiving people and not getting actually a chance to compete in your sport or anything else because they're like, great, come on in, be involved, but we want you to do all these things. You could accidentally sign yourself up for something that you really don't want to do. And so coming in with no proposal whatsoever and hoping for that sponsor to give you something to do is dangerous territory. It kind of goes back into like, don't make me figure it out for you, but also don't do that to yourself when you come through with a proposal. Number four is a sponsorship proposal that starts out with what you've already done and what you've already accomplished. Chances are if we're meeting and we're having a discussion about what you do, I already know these things, or I can quickly Google your results or who you are or find you somewhere. I don't necessarily think this helps because all the stuff that you're listing that you've already done, you did before we were working together. So I get nothing for any of that. Our partnership together doesn't actually benefit from a gold medal you won here or a podium you got there. You were likely working with a different sponsor. So I get nothing for any of this stuff. I think if you wanna put a bio in there somewhere, that's great, but that kind of information in my mind belongs down in the appendix at the very end of the presentation. If I wanted to know more about you or if I wanted to have a full list of your results and all that kind of stuff, great. I used to see this all the time. There was an industry trade show called Interbike and people would walk around with this crumpled up list of their results and they would kind of show it to the sponsor that they wanted to work with. And I always thought that was so funny because it's like that sponsor doesn't get any of that stuff. They are only betting on what you're going to do. And so if you don't have a plan for what you're going to do, you only can show them what you've previously done that's a really big gamble. My fifth pet peeve is not doing your research or not at least trying to develop a relationship with the person that you want to pitch. You can reach out in so many different ways these days from LinkedIn, Instagram, all over the place. You could probably figure out who the marketing person is, who the sponsorship person is, and at least make a connection or at the very least do your homework to figure out what is this company trying to do? What are they looking for? What direction are they going? And how do I fit into that? Going back to the point I made earlier about the values of the company. Do you actually fit in and demonstrate the values of that company? Do you actually use the products that that company made? These things seem minor, but they're the most important part of the sponsorship discussion. And if you're not doing those things correctly because you didn't do your research or you haven't even tested the product itself, that's a problem. So how do we make this whole thing a lot better? Ultimately, what you're doing is a business to business partnership. Although you are consumer facing as someone who posts content on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and everything else, the business part of who you are as an athlete is business to business. And so you have to demonstrate value. You have to be able to show them what the partnership and proposal would actually look like. And you have to have a plan that you can execute. Every business partnership that they do in every other part of their business has a drawn out plan. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And this is what success looks like. And you have to have that exact same thing in place if you're going to have a successful partnership with these brands. Going back to my earlier point, if you don't have a plan of what it's gonna look like, you could get dragged along for theirs and that may not work out so well for you. So it's important for you to have a very clear vision because you've done your homework, you've built the relationship, you've used their products, you demonstrate their values. There's so many things that make sense for this partnership to exist. And once this partnership exists, here are the ways we're gonna build onto it and make it even more valuable. Let me tell you about how we did this thing at Red Bull. I was one of the athlete marketing managers there for a really long time. And what we prided ourselves on was finding the next level of talent. You don't often see Red Bull sign an existing world champion, but you see them sign someone and then a couple years later, they become world champion. And that's the thing that got them really excited was finding that talent who was going to blow up and innovate and do all these incredible things. 
And that was more important of like, we see the trajectory. We know what we can do to help this person get there faster. Let's work together and build this thing up in the right way. But the first thing we did was we built a relationship with that person. So from the point of us first meeting until when they got their Red Bull helmet, it was on average about a year, sometimes all the way up to three years of building a relationship with that person before we actually gave them their helmet. And any one of those athletes would have told you that whole time was worth it. But even better, when we finally did give them the contract and the helmet, we were ready to go and we were ready to start building on top of that relationship. And everything comes super easy because you know each other, you know the plan, you know the expectations, and you can be successful right out of the gate. If you were to just immediately meet somebody and then you give them the contract and you give them the helmet, you actually don't know who they are. You don't have any expectation of what they're going to do. There's so many unknowns and that's a dangerous place for a brand to be. If you've known somebody for a year, you know what kind of person they are. And if you know any Red Bull athletes that are currently out there, you know they're all pretty good people. They're pretty approachable. They're successful. They have a pretty fair idea of what they're doing on and off the field. And that's because they're so vetted. They've been in a relationship with the brand for this long and they've made it through all of the little hurdles along the way to know like this person is legit we should probably put our logo on them and let them do their thing let them continue doing their thing so building that relationship was really important so that you could kind of hit the ground running and actually build something the other side of building that relationship is that when it came time to talk about building media projects or athlete projects we already had a fair sense of what that athlete was trying to do and we can build on top of it as a brand as opposed to again starting from zero and trying to figure out who's who what do they want add in the business cycle there's another year wasted before we figure out what's going on you can hit the ground running a lot faster if you have this relationship intact so that was something that was really important we got to know them we got to understand who they were we got to see the track record of success and know exactly the trajectory that they were going to be on and how we would actually fit into that in a successful way that's how we thought about stuff so that when it was time to actually start the partnership in earnest with a contract in place and branding in place, everything is locked and loaded, ready to go so that you can be successful from the jump. The other thing you might notice about Red Bull athletes is that most of them are with the brand for a very long time. And a lot of it has to do with that relationships that's in place. And the work that was done to build that relationship also means that we're growing together and it makes sense for us to continue partnering together. And that's really what it's all about is having that value that's locked in. They're bringing value to the brand in so many different ways from all the different things that they're doing and the brand knows how to work the best with them. So it's this perfect combination of the two things where Red Bull gets escalating value out of these athletes because they're on their trajectory up and the athlete gets a ton of value from Red Bull because they're doing things to help their career grow. So that back and forth is super, super important, and that's why they're in it for the long haul. The one element that can help flip the script in terms of the sponsor coming to you instead of the other way around is community. If you've built a community through long-form content, whether it's a podcast, YouTube channel, anything like that where you've actually brought this community together to support you, that equals hard data for the sponsor. They can see how many people actually care about you and they also see the quality of interaction. If you're putting out a 10 minute video on YouTube every week and thousands of people are coming to check it out, that's real value because you could be talking about the sponsor themselves. Go back to those original things that I mentioned in the beginning, those brand values and demonstrating the product and all these different things. You can do that in long form content in a really successful way and that matters to a sponsor. You wouldn't wanna get paid in just exposure, so why would a sponsor want to just put a sticker on your helmet and pray for exposure? No, it's all about that depth that we can offer up within long form content, and that's the stuff that's gonna drive the most value for every athlete out there. Building on that, the sponsor wants to have something to support other than what you're doing in competition. And by having your own long form content, that's something that they can point to. That's something they can help you grow. Those are videos that they can help sponsor and support and feature you in. So there's so much more that you can do with this long form side of content that maybe you didn't think of before, but there's real, real value there. And ultimately when it comes down to creating content, 
This is something that's going to take a long time to do, but it's worth the effort. It's all about that long-term consistency over short-term intensity. Spend the time building up this community and it will be worth it for the sponsors to come and find you. If you want to get some extra credit, make a list of five companies that you would want to work with and then go back to the reasons why companies sponsor athletes and figure out how many of the different boxes you check. Do you use their product? Do you bring credibility to them? Do you demonstrate their values? The more of those boxes you can actually check, the better. Those will become the first people that we want to approach. And in a future video, we're gonna go directly into how to get your first sponsor. And I think that will be a great starting place to have your list of companies that you fit the best with, and then we'll build into that of how to approach them, how to really build this thing out, and hopefully how to get them as one of your sponsors. If you want extra, extra credit, hit the link in the description below to sign up for the weekly newsletter. We're gonna get you all dialed in.